So hello everybody, Alex, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yes, my name is Peter. Um, I've been working with Python now for mostly 20 years. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, and I'm still, when I look at Python code, it's uh, like the first time I really remember it in an AI course at the Technical University of Berlin. I still love the cleanness of the language and I still enjoy every day I can work uh, with it. So that's probably also uh, why I'm not only using Python, but I've been uh, quite active in the Python community over the last years. I've given talks at EuroPython, at PyCon and PyData. And last year with my partner in crime, Alex, and some others, uh, we have been co-organizing uh, PyCon DE in Karlsruhe. Uh, and because it worked so well and made that much fun, uh, we are going to do it again this year, um, so if you plan to come over, it's from here about three hours with the train. Um, just uh, follow us on Twitter at PyCoinDE or visit the website where we will publish more information uh, part by part. Um, we, last year we had about three tracks uh, and one session with tutorials and there were about 450 people. Um, we were headed in the ZKM, the Centre for uh, Art and Media in Karlsruhe. It's a really a beautiful uh, venue, so I can just invite you to visit us in Karlsruhe again. So, um, what do I do for a living? I'm a senior software engineer at Blue Yonder. Uh, Blue Yonder is a startup with now about 120 to 150 people and about 70 um, data scientists. Uh, we offer machine learning through software as a service, mostly in the retail sector. So that's we uh, calculate demand predictions, um, order proposals for our customers, uh, big retail chains. And also we do dynamic pricing, mostly in online retailing. Um, the last order, normally my day-to-day -day work is uh, work on our internal platform, um, supporting our data scientists to get uh, data science into production. Um, and the last year I've been mostly busy um, porting all of our stuff to Microsoft Azure because uh, management decided that we want to move from self-hosted uh, servers into the cloud. Um, what does a typical uh, day uh, in our stack look like? So um, as an example, machine learning approach for replenishment um, early in the morning, uh, we get new data from the customer. So our customers, big retail chains, every day they send us the sales from the day before, the current stocks levels, uh, the opportunities from their suppliers where they can get new uh, stuff in. Um, all this uh, goes through an API into our systems. Uh, there we do data cleaning, checking, for example, if they deliver us sales, do we also have locations and products for these values? Do these values make sense? Um, after this, um, all the data is inserted into a central data warehouse. Um, and from there, um, we do feature generation for our machine learning models. That means um, from a um, star or snowflake like schema, uh, we build huge matrices with features for the machine learning. So for example, for a product location day, how much was sold in the past, and we add extra features like what was the weather in the, um, at this day, and what was the price of this product in this location, uh, was there a promotional effect uh, for this uh, product in this location. And with these features, um, we uh, train our predictive models, and in the daily run, the machine le learning model just uh, spills out a probability density function for product location day tuples, so um, we say, okay, in uh, 50%, um, we expect that you tomorrow will sell two of the items in this location. Uh, we do this for multiple days uh, in the future, and then we can take this data uh, and tell our customers, okay, if you want to um, satisfy your demand, um, you need to order in this location, for example, 500 bananas, because we think bananas is the new hot shit and you will sell a lot of them. So, um, maybe you see um, the small gray uh, box in the bottom. So basically that's me and my team working on, uh, bringing the stuff, the data science uh, into production and automate all the stuff. Um, I'm mostly talking about this, the whole talk, but um, you should think about uh, the business uh, of our company is the machine learning 
and that's the important stuff. So we are there to support um, our machine learning uh, specialists. Um, maybe sometimes uh, I talk a little bit different because I also think my stuff is important, but um, keep in mind the machine learning is important stuff. The other um, is just the supporting role. So now, what does it look like? It, everything works fine. Um, our customers are happy, the retailer is happy, he has fresh food, um, he has nothing to waste in the evening or because he has good predictions. Um, he has low um, stock value, so he has not that much bound capital, um, but he also doesn't go out of stock in the evening. So if you, uh, maybe you know it from discounters, if you go in there late in the evening, everything is gone, you don't get the stuff you want. Um, if you take our solution and everything works, it looks like this, perfect. Um, so I could stop now here. Um, if everything works, it's easy. Um, sadly, or it's not that, that easy. So um, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Um, keep it for yourself. Stop um, the recordings. Uh, data scientists are different. Um, they, they are not um, like our um, ops guys, like our engineering guys. Um, so we have lots of them in our company, uh, mostly have, they have a PhD in particular physics. Um, they are very bright people, um, they have a strong academical background, um, they love iPython notebook, um, they love when stuff runs on their machine. They are really into um, getting the best algorithm for their problem, but as soon as they solve the problem on their machine, they move on. They don't have any interest in getting it into production, um, running in every day, running stable. Um, so that's where we somehow uh, need to, to support them to find a way to really get this stuff done every day. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a small, small story. Um, once in a bit of a really big customer, we had problems with our demand predictions. So uh, we figured out, okay, we have a bias in our demand predictions, but we didn't figure out what was the problem with the model. So what did the guy who figured out what, um, that we have this bias, he was able to calculate um, a correction factor in his iPad notebook on his laptop and for 10 days in a row, every uh, day at 12 o'clock um, when the automated da daily run was finished, he logged into his, his iPad notebook and changed the uh, data in the production system for millions of predictions with his correction factor. Um, this is the worst thing that can happen if you, you have this amazing machine learning pipeline, you have all this automation, um, you have lots of uh, guys who put much thought into automation and suddenly you are dependent by one guy that he um, doesn't come back too late from lunch uh, to fix the predictions. So that's not what we want. Um, so that's, um, while this really this sounds funny, but this is mission critical, um, if he types in the wrong uh, value, um, suddenly uh, every retailer or this specific retailer has doubled of the amount of bananas in his stores and all the store managers say, well, what, what should I do with all these bananas? Um, so we try in the platform team, uh, um, we try really to enable uh, our data scientists, but also try to free them as much as possible um, from stuff they don't like to care about, that's scaling, that's logging, that's monitoring, that's running stuff into production, but also uh, giving them an envi environment that they feel like uh, using Python or feel like um, doing machine learning, that it's easy, easy, that they can uh, accomplish amazing stuff, um, but we always need to think, okay, how can we get this into production? Um, since we've been, our company has been founded about five or six years ago, um, so we uh, have built most of our stack our own. We lo use lots of open source, um, but we still operate our own, own con computing cluster. And um, even after the switch into the cloud, um, we now use virtual machines in Azure, um, but we still have our own tooling on top of it. Um, we have been influenced a lot uh, by the 12 Factor app manifesto. Um, that's been a uh, um, write up from the Her Heroku developers, I think in 2014 or something. Or something. Um, and it's been their best practices on how to run and scale um, mostly websites and web services. So this does not fit 100% um, to data science applications. 
but it really influenced lots of our decisions um, when we built our own platform. So I think this is something engineer says, okay, um, have everything in a code base, tracked in, re in revision control. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. Um, still, not everybody works this way. We have heard uh, lately there are still CS, uh, CSV, uh, CV, CVS uh, in production. People mail tarballs tar to each other. So that's the foundation. Okay, get it into revision control. Um, one thing that's not always that easy in, in Python, or still there's some discussion around it, so explicitly declare uh, and isolate dependencies. I'll come later on how we do this. I think it's most important that what you uh, deploy to production is really pinned down to the last dependency and that we really know what is running in production, otherwise you'll never be able to fix things. Um, Another thing that's mostly for, for people doing open source development, it's also clear that you never check in your credentials in your GitHub repository. Um, if you have internal repositories, suddenly that's not that clear anymore. Um, people um, hard code um, database strings or uh, logging servers into their application, so that's also a no-go. Split your um, code from your configuration. Uh, think of it about chemicals. If you put them together, they will explode. Just do it in production, okay? At the last step, um, from the one side, there comes the code. From the other side, there comes the configuration. Um, Trial-factor apps are mostly about uh, stateless apps. Uh, that's the easy part uh, of scaling your application. Um, you can shut them down, uh, spin more instances up. Um, but especially in data science, uh, you always need data to, to do the data science. So where do you store the data? Mostly in databases or in blob storages. Um, so you need a way uh, to have backing sources, backing services uh, attached to your application. Uh, in the best case, um, you are able to switch them on and off and to exchange them. And if you separate state and the stateless application and are able um, to change uh, the resources that you attach to your application, then you are much, uh, then your operation, the daily um, business will be much easier. Um, another mostly no-brainer, if you are a little bit into software uh, engineering, um, that you um, strictly separate build and run stages, so you have a Jenkins or something like that where you test your application at the end if all tests are green um, and you have a deployable, um, that's mostly a tar ball, a zip file, a Python wheel, um, and then you can run this deployable in different stages. What are stages? You can have a test environment where you can put your deployable to test if everything works like you expect. You can have a staging environment where a customer can integrate against, and if all these gates are passed green and it works, and then you can put the deployable into production. Yes, um, the sixth um, factor of the 12-factor apps is execute um, an app as stateless process. Um, if you don't have state, that's fine. If you have state, you need to externalize it. Um, we use lots of internal HTTP services, but also Dask services. And um, you don't want to care about, oh, when I deploy it, which host, which um, port does it run? So. You deploy your application and the environment of the application takes care um, that you get attached a uh, host and a port and export this information for other services so that they consume, can consume your uh, services. Um, an easy way to scale out is to scale out via process model. Um, as we have heard in the talk, two talks before, um, Python is not the best at multi-threading, so it's always easier if you have, can have multiple processes um, if you take uh, data science tools like Dasks, um, they will handle this for you. Um, you just need to find a way that your environment can spill up uh, lots of instances of your Dask uh, workers, and then you can distribute um, your whole tasks to a computing engine. Um, the faster and uh, the more graceful your application start up and come down, the easier it is to switch um, nodes in your data science cluster um, to move certain workloads from one node to another. So if you don't, um, in the best way, you don't try to, to um, use local resources, but always um, use remote resources, and thus, thus you can uh, scale up and scale down uh, much faster. Um, about the development in different... Uh, areas, I've already said something. Um, 
Another thing which is important, especially in distributed environments, um, is that you can't access your logs locally anymore. Um, so you have to treat your logs like uh, event streams and you have to push them from the node where the computation is running to another um, logging service where you aggregate them and then can provide them to your set data scientists. And then another thing um, that you should uh, really take care of is that admin or management tasks or some tasks like database migrations um, run on your cluster, on your envi environment that is defined and not from a local machine. So um, these are the original 12-factor, um, or just the 12-factor manifesto. Um, the first thing that we decided, um, everything that runs uh, in production at Blue Yonder is deployed as a managed service, period. Um, we had it before, Snowflake servers, um, lots of people have root access to certain servers deploying stuff, you don't know anymore what's running there. Um, we decided, okay, that's not the way we want to go, and that's why we build a data science platform internally, where you can de deploy your stuff as services in a managed environment through APIs. So no more root access, um, we are done with this. Um, this is a little bit um, what our platform looks like. Um, so at the bottom, um, we have lots of physical or virtual machine nodes. Um, on top of this, um, we have Apache Mesos and Apache Aurora. Um, you could probably uh, exchange um, them with Kubernetes. Um, at the time when we decided for the software stack, um, it still looked like Apache Mesos might um, win uh, the battle, but yeah. And you can think of the Apache Aurora Mesos as a cluster operation, operation system. Um, it's, it borrows much of the concepts from the Linux kernel, but it's not running anymore on, on, one, on, one, virtual, on one physical machine, but it spans over multiple machines. Um, but you also have the possibility um, to give certain, um, uh, certain stuff like uh, CPU, memory, or storage to processes, to isolate processes, um, to start processes in containers where you can run stuff, but it's a framework that works over a whole, uh, a whole computing cluster. Um, on top of this, we have um, identified some services that we, our, our data scientists need, and we provide these as templates to our data scientists, so that's a VSGI service, so you can basically deploy HTTP services with an API call. You say, okay, you want to install these requirements, and this is the callable that should be run uh, when the server is built up. And um, thus it makes it very easy um, to generate or to de uh, develop and deploy new services in a defined environment. As I said earlier, you need one shot or cron services, same concept. And then uh, the other three are more for the data science context, so our data science can uh, fill out or spin up their Jupyter notebooks. Um, they can start DAS clusters for heavy machine learning and we use Apache Airflow uh, as a tool to orchestrate uh, all this stuff. So what does um, a production uh, system look like? Um, so it's a screenshot from an internal management UI. Um, don't look that much at the UI. This is a real customer, but you see we have lots of services. Um, we have different service types, like the Airflow service, like web services, like in Jupyter Notebook. And um, we can attach different resource classes to our services. So if you just want to have a demo or test something, you can get a small instance with one CPU and eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, if you need to do more heavyweight stuff, you can um, move up to 64 cores and I think 256 uh, um, gigabyte of memory. And of course, like the DAS clusters, you can have multiple instances uh, of your nodes um, that then form a cluster. Um, and all this is manageable either through the UI, but the more preferred way is always deploy via our um, API. So either we provide an internal Ansible um, playbooks where you can provide different services and all this stuff is automatically deployed. Um, so as I said, we deploy lots of services um, that form of, or that are deployed for a customer and we use Airflow uh, to really orchestrate all the stuff. So in our daily uh, business, there are uh, lots of stages um, included. 
And before we had or introduced Airflow, it was really hard uh, for the first level support or even for the second level support to see what's the current status of a daily run. Um, since we have introduced uh, Airflow, it's much more easy to see what's going on. You see, sometimes we fail, that's uh, also, that happens, but uh, you can pretty fast see, okay, where did the run fail? Uh, can we uh, trigger or restart uh, certain services um, and just have a much better uh, view of your overall system? So this uh, was really a huge step forward for us uh, to force um, data science to provide APIs for their uh, model runs and then use these APIs via Airflow uh, to trigger um, certain steps. So what does a service configuration look like? Uh, that's again a screenshot from our internal tooling, but it's uh, nice to demonstrate what you can, what you can have. Um, we always support at least uh, two versions of, of Debian containers where um, the data sciences can deploy stuff into. This helps us always migrating, so you can, don't have one break in time where you are forced to go to a new version, but you have a period of two or three months, you can deploy um, to the new version, Debian 8 or Debian 9 now, uh, check how the stuff is going, and if it's working, do the migration, and then wait until the, the next um, operation system version, major version. The same goes for Python. Um, so yeah, we still have some legacy Python 2.7 code, but mostly we are running now on Python 3.6. Um, and you can have these uh, predefined T-shirt sizes, what we call them as resource classes. Um, but you can also say, okay, I have a different, uh, maybe some com computations don't need that much RAM, but more CPUs. Um, you can also uh, configure this. And then the cluster operation system, Almesos, takes care to schedule uh, your service on a node that has enough resources um, to run the service. Um, what you get for free uh, with, every so, uh, with every service uh, you run, so you get uh, an endpoint. Um, that's the, really the location on which server this um, service is running. And you can also um, configure static endpoints. So if you um, shut down one node, um, as Apache Mesos will take care to move your service to another node because it sees, okay, this node went down. Um, it spins up a new instance on another node. Um, so the endpoint would change, but the static endpoint um, would always be the same. So that's the pattern of having a co-located proxy beside to your service. And then you can see um, you have a log of revisions that have been deployed of your service. So you can specify the requirements which you will want to deploy your service with, and you have different revisions. So it's easy when you deploy on your revision, see, okay, something breaks, doesn't behave that uh, anymore like it was before. You can switch back to a previous uh, revision um, and always know what has been deployed into production. Um, one, as one of the also very critical things, um, especially in the Python world, is packaging. Um, if you want to know what's running in production, uh, you need a way uh, to have good packaging and dependency declaration. Um, what we use internally is a software called DevPyNet. Um, it's developed by Holger Krekel from uh, Freiburg. Um, it's basically an API-compatible uh, clone to PyPy.org, uh, so it's a package index. Um, we use it in three different ways. So the first way is we really have a set of officially um, whitelisted packages that can be used uh, in, our, in our software. Um, so we cache and mirror these uh, dependencies in-house so, so that we don't depend on the external PyPy server. Um, I don't know who of you is aware of the left pad uh, disaster in the JavaScript world uh, where they removed one package and everything got down because nobody could deploy anymore because this package was removed. So to prevent this, we cache all these uh, whitelisted packages in-house and we also, all of our software that goes into production needs to be uploaded to our internal uh, repository. Um, so you test it, you build it, then you upload it uh, to our internal DevPy, and from there it could be, it, and only from there it could be deployed into production. Um, I'll just give a little bit about uh, the next. Um, it's pretty important for data science, not so much, so much for these talks. Uh, and I have colleagues um, which help talks about this. Um, we use three kind of attached um, storage systems for our data science workflows. 
So the first one is a highly performant column, columnar store. That's a database, a shared database of a multiple node, an in-memory database. Um, if you are interested more in how we use it, um, just go to this PyCon uh, DE talk from my colleague. Um, he's also the author of TurboDBC. That's a very fast uh, access um, of databases via um, ODBC. The next attached storage service that we uh, use or that our data, service, uh, data scientists can use uh, is a binary object storage. Um, since we have moved to Microsoft Azure, we use the Microsoft Azure blob storage. And especially together uh, with the Parquet, uh, Apache Parquet file format, this is a very efficient way um, to store immutable data um, in uh, data sets uh, in an object storage. And immutable data is very important in data science because then you can test different algorithms, different configurations on the same data. Um, so that's also a very important thing. And then uh, we have a simple Postgres service for Astros and Actional Store. So our data scientists have the possibility um, to request um, Postgres as a service. Um, if you want to see how this works, uh, just also go to our GitHub repository. It's basically an API where you can say, OK, give me a small Postgres instance. And in the background, it starts a new Postgres cluster, gives you the credentials, has some limits on size. Um, but it's always handy to have a transactional store at hand. Um, what we take mostly care of and provide to our users is observability. Um, observability is a measure how well internal states of our system uh, can be inferred from knowledge that you can query from the outside. Um, if you look at this hierarchy of reliability, that's from the Google SRE book, um, you see um, if you want to have a good product, you depend on good development, you depend on capacity planning, you need testing release procedures, um, you need root cause analysis, you need incident response. But all this uh, cannot happen if you don't have monitoring in place. If you don't have monitoring in place, uh, you don't know what's going on into your system, you can't do uh, incident response, you can't do root cause analysis. So monitoring is extremely important uh, to have it in place. And that's why we take care in our platform stack um, to have monitoring provided with each service, regardless how you deploy it. Um, what's the topology um, that, we, that we have? So we have metrics, so we can query our services and they give back metrics on, on the current status of, of the service. Um, we have tracing where you can see through different services if requests flow through the service um, where um, uh, re requests were triggered and which um, previous service triggered them. And of course, you have uh, logging uh, events. Um, we use Greylog for this. Um, to have structured logging in place is always a big plus because as soon as you start working on distributed systems, uh, you don't know anymore where something runs and structured logging really helps you to um, aggregate um, information from, from your logging stuff. Um, what does uh, a simple matrix query look like? Uh, so that's for an HTTP or VSGI service. Um, if you query the matrix interface of one of our services, you always get uh, this information back. Um, it's a key like HTTP request duration in seconds, and it has some uh, labels attached like the endpoint and the method, and then it has a number. Um, we use this information with Prometheus and Grafana. So Prometheus is a time series database. It queries all our services. So if you spin up a new service, it will be queried automatically. Uh, it collects this data, and then you can put alerting in place on top of this uh, data or uh, build dashboards. This is a daily run. Uh, we just see how much total memory um, a service has used. And if you're a little bit used uh, to these dashboards, you see with a blink of an eye if the um, service is working correctly or if it's not working. Um, things go wrong. Um, so we have put in place crash reporting. Sentry is a software developed by Armin Ronacker. Um, he's the main author of Jinja 2 and um, Flask. Um, so he's very well known in the Python uh, context. Um, but you, especially again with distributed system, you want to get noticed, but you don't want to get 500 mails from your 500 distributed clusters. So you want to get noticed once and you want to get context. Um, very easy to use it in Flask. It's just um, wrapping your application. Um, you can also use Raven Client uh, to capture messages on your own. What do you get? Um, 
it's very important you get context. So if there is an exception somewhere, Sentry catch it is, you get uh, the source code at the bottom where you see, okay, where did the exception happen? And you get also meta information. I think the most important one is which release was it, uh, on which server it happened. And then you can have an action on this incident. So you could either just ignore it, that's pretty bad, but you could also flag this exception. Okay, we have fixed it in a new version uh, and thus um, just see what's happening. And if you say it's fixed in a new version, you won't get a notice again. So it's also very important uh, for your daily business. So time is up, uh, I'm done. Uh, just think about it the next time if you are in a supermarket and see happy people shopping, new groceries, everything is fine. Uh, it's hard to get data science into production every day. Um, if you're interested in the slides, go to GitHub uh, Blue Yonder. Um, I'll upload the slides and I hope to see you all at PyCon DE in October. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, who will think about Peter when shopping for bananas in the future? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, questions? Oh, questions? All questions answers? Uh, I don't know if you really uh, already answered it, but I'd uh, like to ask again. So, how do you deal, uh, basically, how do you deploy a data scientist code, basically? So, it's like Jupyter Notebooks and some crappy... Uh, yeah, that's not really how we deploy in a production. So, so we what do you do basically? How he, he, do you bridge the gap between? Uh, he, as you see, he's forced to uh, provide a package on the on the DevPy server, and then he can say to a declarative API, "Okay, deploy me a service with this package and this version, and this is then used uh, as a deployment on the server." Oh, I see. So, so you deploy the ready-made package by the data scientist. Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Oh, we're running out of time, so I'm sure Peter will... So I'll be here around if you just come to me and have a beer. All right, so thanks again, Peter, and...